last few years this economy has been so sluggish, reports say it's getting better, but I am drowning in debt and I really wish the national debt was not the cause. The national debt is not comparable. Please stop. Thanks. The national debt is not comparable to your own personal debt. The national debt is reflection of the private sector's desire to save. What is so wrong with saving? Nothing. But if everyone saved at the same time, no one would have jobs. Think about it. The U.S. economy is 70% consumer-driven. Spending equal income to businesses. Income to businesses equal sales. Sales equal jobs. <coughs> But what about our job creators? You mean the misunderstood superheroes of capitalism that are just $10 billion away from sleeping under the nearest bridge, unless they get further tax cuts? Or those on Wall Street who haven't had a hit of cocaine in weeks because Big Bird still teaches children how to read? Is there a VIP entrance around here? I am VIP. Um, yeah. Them, I suppose. You mean those corporations that are sitting on trillions of dollars in cash, while profits hit a new record high? While wages hit an all-time low? Or the 1% that are doing better than ever in an economy with tens of millions unemployed, with income disparity not seen since 1929? Um, yeah. Them too, I suppose. We interrupt this broadcast for a public service announcement to discuss the economic effects of trickle-down policies over the last 30 years. Supply-side economics theorizes that tax cuts to the wealthy and deregulation will provide an environment where wealth would trickle down to the rest of us. This graph shows the growth of real hourly compensation for workers and productivity. As we can see, the hourly compensation for workers grew in tandem with productivity from 1948 to 1973. After 1973, productivity grew strongly, especially after 1995, while wages remained relatively stagnant. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! This divergence of pay and productivity has meant that many workers have not been benefiting from productivity growth. The economy could afford higher pay but it was not providing it. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. In this next graph we show the effect of income distribution between 1979 and 2007. As you can see, for the 1% of the population, income grew by 275%. For the population in the middle of the income scale, growth in household income was just under 40%, and 18% for those in the lowest quintile. In conclusion, trickle-down economics is another way of telling you it's raining outside, when really, you're just getting pissed on. And now we return you to your regularly scheduled it's programming. It's conceivable that Zhang could use his considerable influence to single-handedly end China's purchase of the U.S. debt. This country runs on deficit spending if, if we can't borrow money. We couldn't meet our obligations, the government would shut down. Austerity measures would be imposed. We'd lose our ability to deploy our military around the world. And then with the U.S. neutralized, our enemies would be able to explore their interests unchecked. That's right. And there would be an explosion of regional conflicts, any one of which could send us toward global war. Or that we might not even be able to win. Yeehaw! Oh brother. What about China though? The President and Congress say we are broke. The US is a sovereign currency issuer. So are countries like the UK, Japan, Canada, and Australia. Do you really believe we need to borrow from China, the dollar in which only the US can create? Yes. Yes, I do. We don't have the same budget constraints that a household does. Please stop. Thanks. For example, on the first day of the financial crisis in 2008, the Fed created $1 trillion, out of thin air, to provide liquidity to the banks. 
Yet when Social Security falls short in 25 years by that same amount, all of a sudden we're broke, and need to slash entitlement spending immediately. But if we don't slash government spending, we will become the next Greece. Opa. Opa. Negative. When Greece joined the Eurozone, they gave up their right to issue their own currency, and became a currency user of the Euro. Under their monetary system, they face the same solvency constraints the household does. The US, on the other hand, can never involuntarily default on its obligations. As a currency issuer, we can never run out of money. Then why does the US government need to borrow money from the private sector? Again, the government doesn't borrow its own currency. Under our current fiat monetary system, when the treasury deficit spends, the Fed provides an equivalent amount of reserve balances that are then used by banks to purchase the treasury bonds. As a result, Government deficits are the non-government sector's financial wealth. We are here to discuss the economic flows in and out of the economy, using the sectoral balances approach. The economy can be divided into three sectors. First, the private domestic sector, which includes households and businesses. Second, the public or government sector. And last, the foreign sector which includes trade with the rest of the world. If a sector spends more than it earns, it is said to be in deficit. On the other hand, if any sector earns more than it spends, it will be in surplus. By accounting identity, the sum of these three sectors that make up our economy must sum to zero. This is blasphemy! This is madness! To illustrate these points graphically, let's take a look at this next chart which graphs the financial balances for each sector over the past 40 years. What we can see is that government deficits, the red line, largely mirror the private sector surplus, represented on the blue line. History shows that the private sector is generally in a surplus, accommodated by government deficits. One exception is the Clinton surpluses in the late 90s. What sectoral balances tell us is that if the government runs a surplus and a trade deficit exists, the private sector absolutely must be in deficit. By identity, it can be no other way. It should be noted that since the national debt is the sum of past deficits, a goal to pay down the national debt would mean eliminating all non-government net financial wealth. To the penny. This is not Sparta! This last graph should help to explain why the private sector fell into deficit for the first time since 1929. This chart shows that the personal saving rate, the blue line, has drastically declined from its peak of 12% in 1975, to a low of just under 1% in 2005. We can also see that household debt increased sharply at the start of the Clinton surplus years in 1998 until the crash in 2008, when households could no longer sustain its unprecedented levels of debt. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Wait a minute. If the personal savings rate was so low, where did the banks get the money to make all those loans? Like the government. Banks create money out of thin air. They don't sit around waiting for someone to make a deposit before they lend. Loans create deposits. Just wait until China hears about all of your nonsense here today. Why wait? I'll tell them right now. Fine, you have three minutes. I'm a busy woman creating jobs. Go. GDP is a measure of how much money is spent buying goods and services every year. We face a simple problem, we're living way below our means, unemployment is at 8%, and 5% of the nation's industrial capacity is sitting idle. This represents an output gap estimated at $9.7 billion per day in lost income. There isn't enough total spending in the economy to employ everyone who wants to work, but who will spend. Households lost $16 trillion of wealth from late 2007 to early 2009 and have spent the last few years, not spending, 
but saving and paying down debt, causing the economy to stagnate. As for corporations, they are already sitting on record profits, and hesitant to hire and reluctant to invest because of a lack of customers. What about foreigners? Europe, China, India, Russia, Brazil, etc. are slowing or already in recession. That leaves only one sector. The government. And some very powerful myths. Our money comes from China. We've already spent too much. We're out of money. The government, just like a household, has to live within its means. Households, however, can only spend what they earn or what they can borrow. They cannot spend more than their income for very long as the 2008 financial collapse proved. Households are users of the currency. This house is different. The government is a currency issuer. This picture has no economic meaning. China is not our banker. The Federal Reserve is. Here is Alan Greenspan from 1997. Government cannot become insolvent with respect to obligations in its own currency. A fiat money system, like the ones we have today, can produce such claims without limit. We are not Greece. Greece is a currency user of the euro and have the same solvency constraints as a household. They need to borrow from the private sector and its interest rates are subject to market discipline. The U.S. does not need to borrow. And the Fed sets the rates. The size of our deficit has no relation to interest rates. None of this is a free lunch. Everything has a cost, but there is not a finite supply of money in which we have to allocate to the wealthy first in order to create jobs. We have the money. We have the real resources and we should have much higher incomes in which to grow the economy without having to accumulate massive amounts of personal debt. America's big challenges are unemployment, inequality, education, crumbling infrastructure, fossil fuel dependency, environmental hazards, and political corruption. Failure to address these issues is the world we will leave to our grandkids, yet we are obsessed with the deficit. Laugh out loud. We should be looking at whether we have the necessary resources available, not the necessary money. All money is created out of thin air, real resources or not. If there is one thing we learned from the 2008 financial crisis, bankers are far more powerful than central banks and the way they can destroy money faster than an overheating printing press can create it. And no, China has nothing to say about any of this. Get over it. Done. By the way, I knew all that the whole time. What do I look like to you? Hmm, a crash test dummy proving the case for economic seat belts? That's enough for today. Let's ditch this joint. We can't boss. I wrecked the car, remember? Where we are going, we don't need cars. Um, is this safe? Did you survive the ninja? By the way, Ninjas are from Japan, and that timer was right. Uh oh. Is it okay to take my seat belt off now? Oh, uh, stop it. What a strange place. What could possibly go wrong here? Other than that. Please stop. I mean, Please proceed. Play it again, boss.